Thanks, Bill. It's uh, good to have a chance to come along today and to speak to everyone on this topic. I um, certainly recognise the importance of it. Um, as like Bill suggested, um, when I first started, my first year was as a trainee agronomist at Kadena uh, with Trevor Dillon. So one of the things I did as part of that role was certainly going along to a lot of these sorts of sites where there were plenty of trials being undertaken and I certainly spent a fair bit of time at heart in my first year. So I can certainly uh, appreciate the background and the good work that does come from doing these sorts of trials. But today I'm uh, here as a regulator from PERSA, so I'm here to speak about the, I guess, regulatory context uh, of this particular topic. So I'll try and um, go through some of the options that actually do allow this to happen and I guess cover some of the risks of things that can go wrong if we don't do go about it the right way. But there certainly are ways that it can be undertaken. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the forum discussion a little bit later as well. Regulatory background. Um, the use of Ag Chem products is regulated under a Agricultural and Veterinary Chemical Control of Use Act. So in South Australia, the use of chemicals is controlled under state legislation. And we've got regulations that actually describe what's permitted and what's prohibited. Uh, the regulations do actually allow some extensions to the specific directions for use on the label. So in some circumstances where there's no uh, change to the level of risk to trade or health and safety in the environment, the, the legislation does take that into account. So I'll cover that uh, in a little bit more detail shortly. I guess there's two potential scenarios that you can look at when we're doing these sort of trials. And I just wanted to clarify what, what the, the terms mean in terms of unregistered use and off-label use. So I've tried to split them into two separate groups here. So an, a, an agricultural product is considered unregistered if it's got no APVMA registered use, i.e. there's no approved label or a permit for it. So separate to that is the second issue is the off-label use. So that's where there is uh, an APVMA registration, but that use is not described on the label. So there's two separate issues that we can consider when we're doing these sorts of trials. I expect in most of the circumstances we're talking about the second option uh, today of off-label use, but I'll cover the first as well. So for unregistered products where there's uh, basically, if the product has no APVMA registration or a permit in Australia, it's illegal to use it in trials or demonstrations or in any other place unless it meets the conditions of a permit. 27250. So there's only one circumstance uh, legally where you can use products that are not registered in Australia. And that's if you comply with this permit called Permit 7250, which is a permit from the APVMA, and it's a general one, it's not specific, that allows the conduct of small scale trials with ag and vet um, chemicals. So the risks, I guess, if you're not following that permit and you want to use something unregistered in Australia, there's certainly there's a risk to trade. Uh, there'd be no Australian MRL in place, or most likely there would be no Australian MRL. Um, there'd be Oc health and safety issues for users. You've got no label, you've got no permit, so you don't know what are the safe operating uh, parameters for the use of that chemical. And there's certainly risks to environment and human health if it's spray drifted on somebody else or was caused a residue problem. So essentially, for these products where there's no registration, there's no risk management in the form of a label or a permit which is quite a risk. So it is actually an offence to use or possess an unregistered product under our legislation and that offence carries a fine of up to 35000 and it's a prosecution so it's not an expiation. It's treated very seriously if you're, if you're uh, either using or possessing a product that's not registered uh, in Australia. The alternative option is to apply for a research permit. So if you do want to use a unregistered product in Australia there's certainly the APVMA have a process for applying for a re research permit. Now I'll go into a little bit more detail about this permit 7250 because it does actually allow uh, for, for a small scale uh, permit, small scale trials to be conducted. So it's probably worth going through the details of that because this permit not only applies to uh, when there's no registered product in Australia, but the permit also applies if there is a registered product but not for that use. So this is probably the most important uh, part that I'll cover today is the, the details of this permit 7250. Persons who can conduct uh, a trial under this permit, uh, it's, it's defined on the permit itself. So the things I'm showing you today I've, I've quoted out of the permit. Uh, 
Some of them I've phrased, uh, I've taken some of the words out just to make it easier to cover, but most of them I've taken word for word. So in this case, a person who can conduct a trial, all persons who are trained or experienced in the handling and use of agricultural or veterinary chemicals, and who handle and use these chemicals as part of their normal duties in their employment. Now we spoke to the APVMA to try and clear up any confusion about what that interpretation might mean. And our understanding is that the APVMA have a fairly broad interpretation uh, of the persons who can use that. And essentially, if you're a trained or experienced producer in a pharma group, uh, you've got your chemical training certificates, or you're a consultant and you've got your chemical training certificates, then for the purpose of uh, trials or demonstrations, you'd be, you'd be eligible under this. So that's our understanding of what the APVMA, when we spoke to them specifically about what that means. Um, but if we are designing any, any set protocol, it would probably be worth checking with them just to get the exact wording from them about that. But, but our interpretation of what they've said, and that's after speaking to them, is that most producers or consultants, providing they've got that experience or training, can certainly use those chemicals. Products that can be used, uh, any active constituent, except if it contains a genetically modified organism. Um, we also have genetic... In terms of the crops itself, there's separate legislations for the crops, so I won't go over that. Um, the only other two issues there are if the product is prohibited in South Australia under the control of use legislation. Now, generally, the only products prohibited here are things like organochlorine chemicals, those sort of chemicals that have been banned for quite a number of years. So we're not talking about a, a large list, uh, but there are some products that have obviously been banned for, for certain reasons and it's a small list, uh, but the organochlorines are probably the best example, so things like DDT and Dildrin and Aldrin and those sorts of products. Um, the other exception is if the product is prohibited under APVMA legislation. Now they've got a bit of a... their legislation's a bit more complex in terms of what they consider banned, because it covers uh, things in terms of use, manufacture, um, exporting, so it's quite a... it's a bit of a longer list, but again, it's really those chemicals such as organochlorines or other ones that have international implications that are banned. So for general purposes, um, most of the chemicals that we're talking about for trials here aren't going to be in those categories. As long as you're not trying to go back to an old chemical like DDT, you're relatively uh, safe. But it, again, for protocols, you probably do need to check, check those lists. The purpose or situation. So, the key point about this particular um, description is that trials can be conducted to generate data for efficacy, residues, crop or animal safety or other scientific information outside the confines of a research facility where the size does not exceed the following. And this is, I guess, the key point here. A total of five hectares nationally with a maximum of one hectare in any one jurisdiction. And jurisdiction meaning state. So providing you're not going over a trial size of a he one hectare. Um, that's the key criteria in terms of, of this particular aspect of the permit. Some of the additional conditions. Uh, point five there, do not dispose of any produce from the plants uh, treated during a trial that can result in direct or indirect consumption of the produce. Clearly under this permit, one of the risks, uh, I guess, is, is trade or residue, consum sorry, residue consumption, and that's not controlled by the permit. So the permit basically puts in place a condition that says you can't consume it or, or can't give it to someone who, who may consume it. Similarly, with number six, uh, can't, to control the human health risks, do not dispose or allow the use of the commodity to come into direct or indirect exposure as well. Point seven, uh, to control the human health risk, you have to uh, wear the appropriate personal protective equipment to minimise your exposure to chemicals via the eyes, skin, nose or mouth. So there's nothing too dramatic in, in, these, in these elements of, the, of this permit. They're, they're the usual common sense type things of making sure that we're controlling our risk to residues and controlling our uh, safety risk for people applying it. There are certainly um, record keeping requirements. The date the trial is conducted, um, for trials outside of research facilities, you need to record the jurisdiction and location. Uh, the trial details, so what was, the, what was being treated, 
um, the pest control, reason for treating, rates and frequency of application, uh, the active constituents, uh, how you disposed of the produce that was treated, and the names of the people uh, actually conducting the trial. Again, I don't think there's anything in that particular list that most people who are conducting trials wouldn't be recording as normal part of business because you'd really want to know all of that information as part of your trial in any case. So I don't think there's anything too scary in terms of the, the record keeping requirements and they're not particularly, you know, they're, they're not that difficult to follow. And you do need to keep those for two years. So uh, what I've covered there is, is Permit 7250 and that's the only option if you want to use something that's that's not registered in Australia. So I'll go and talk now about off-label use for, for trials and demonstrations. So the ag products can be used off-label for trials under certain circumstances and I've defined those here. So the first one is if the situation or use as in the crop that you're using it on is already on the label for another state um, you, can, you can use that product in South Australia. So our legislation basically says it doesn't matter what the pest that you're trying to control is. If you, it, does, it makes no difference what the pest is as long as that crop has a registration somewhere in Australia and that you don't exceed the label rate or the frequency then you're entitled to be able to use that product in South Australia. The other um, I guess situations where you can use things off-label is if there's an existing off-label permit so you'd want to check whether that might already be in case. And the third one is, as I've already described, um, if the use is conducted under permit 7250. So that permit I just described applies equally for products that you want to use off-label. So providing you're not going over the one hectare size, you can follow this permit, providing you're keeping your records, um, you can use that permit for this particular situation as well. The risks in the off-label uh, use situation are a bit more controlled um, because if it was the first example, the situation of use is allowed in another state, the APVMA has already assessed uh, the trade risks, the op health and safety risks and the environmental risks. So they're already been assessed if it's already uh, used in another state. The other risks are controlled by the conditions of the permit. So if there's an off-label permit, obviously it already puts in place some risk management parameters around, around that. And the same with the permit 7250, there's the risk factors that are taken into consideration there. With this one, it's an offence not to observe the mandatory instructions on the label or the conditions of the permit. And again, uh, as with most of the offences in, in our legislation, uh, it could result in prosecution and up to a $35,000 fine. So it is a, a fairly, uh, I guess, big penalty. What I should, uh, I guess, point out about the, about the penalties is if something goes wrong with the sort of trial work you're doing is where these things are going to come into play. If someone got sick because they used something and it was off-label and they weren't following one of these parameters or if there was a residue issue that arose because of not following any of these conditions or a spray drift or an incident occurred, uh, that's where these sorts of things would come into play. As uh, Bill mentioned, most of the times in the past things have been sorted out between people uh, because of the nature of the cooperation between farmers and the people doing the trial. But that's not always the case and particularly uh, up against areas where there are people who might have different interests, they do want these things to be taken seriously and so there's still the potential for, for that to take place. Again, the alternative option if one of those permit situations doesn't apply or the situation use isn't on the label in another state is to actually apply for a trial permit. And I know Kevin's going to cover that in a little bit more detail. So just, I guess, to summarise, for trials or demonstrations involving an unregistered prop, uh, chemical, it's illegal unless it's conducted under the conditions of Permit 7250. So that's as straightforward as it is. Either you're using that Permit 7250 for an unregistered product or it's considered illegal. For trials, demonstrations involving off-label use, which I think is really what we're talking about in the majority of situations here. Uh, again, it's illegal unless the crop or situation is on the label for another state, there's an existing off-label permit, or that you're following the conditions of that permit 7250. So I guess if you're designing a protocol for trials, some of the things to take into consideration would be 
is it an unregistered product in Australia or is it an off-label product? That's a relatively simple assessment. For unregistered products, you need to follow those conditions in that permit 7250. So check your size limitations in terms of how many hectares it is. Check your band lists from the APVMA in Persia and make sure you're using the right safety equipment and records. Otherwise, you need to apply for that trial permit. For off-label use, check for any existing off-label permits. Check if the situation or crop is allowed in another state. Again, refer to permit 7250, which has those same restrictions I mentioned, or otherwise apply for a trial permit. So I guess that sort of summarises it from a, a regulatory point of view. Uh, Kevin will probably cover a bit more practical uh, side of things than this, uh, but that's, that's the uh, regulatory background to keep in mind. Uh, I'll be part of the panel, so I'm certainly happy to be involved in discussions later on that are cover things in a bit more detail. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. I reckon...